Assalamu alaikum and a very good afternoon to all viewers wherever you are. Hello and thank you so much for being here this afternoon. Uh, welcome to our distinguished lecture series and webinar. Actually, is this event is brought to you by the Faculty of Engineering, University of Technology Malaysia. And first of all, thank you for joining us in this Facebook Live. I hope every one of us is doing well during this pandemic COVID-19 phenomena. My name is Nor Azman Ismail from School of Computing. I'm here to moderate this webinar session and let you know that this event is one of our initiative for professors around the world to share their expertise and perhaps their experience during the COVID-19 pandemic. Today, we are pleased to welcome Professor Hassan Ugayo, a very special guest from the United Kingdom. Hi, Professor Hassan. Okay. Professor Hassan is a mathematician and computer scientist, specialty in visual computing, and actually currently he is the director of Center of Visual Computing, University of Bradford, United Kingdom. I have an opportunity to know Prof. Hassan during his academic visit to Malaysia a few months ago. And at the same time, we share the same research interest in visual computing, including face recognition project. It is a wonderful discussion uh, during the visit anyway. And today, he will be sharing his expert opinion on the topic of deep, deep face recognition for unmasking the face of spy. Without further ado, I will pass our session to Professor Dr. Rafix, the Dean of Faculty of Engineering, to introduce more about Prof. Hassan. Over to you, Dr. Thank you, Prof. Noor Azman. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, welcome to our 101 UTM Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series. Uh, we, we are currently celebrating our 100th Distinguished Lecture Series this week. Uh, my name is Muhammad Rafiq and I'm the Dean of Engineering, University of Technology, Malaysia. Today, it is my utmost pleasure to welcome Professor Hassan Ugain from the University of Bradford, United Kingdom. A bit about our distinguished speaker today. Professor Hassan Ugain is the Director of the Center for Visual Computing at the University of Bradford in the United Kingdom. He is a renowned computer scientist in the area of visual computing and artificial intelligence. He is an advocate of AI for helping to tackle real world issues in the areas of digital health, innovative engineering and sustainable societies in general. More specifically, he works in the area of human biometrics, especially in the development of cutting edge AI solutions for biometric face recognition. His most recent work in this area includes helping to unravel the real identity of the two Russian spies at the heart of the Salisbury Novichok poisoning case, one of the biggest international stories of 2018. So there is a brief biography of our distinguished speaker today. Here now is Professor Hassan Ugain from the University of Bradford, United Kingdom, with a lecture on deep face recognition for unmasking the face of a spy and more. Professor Hassan, over to you. Thank you, Professor Rafiq, uh, and thank you, Professor Ismail, for the introduction, and also thank you for the kind invitation uh, for giving me this opportunity to actually speak about uh, a topic which is very close to my heart and uh, a topic on which I've been doing quite a lot of research uh, for a number of years. So uh, let me just try and share my screen uh, if I can. Yeah, it works. Uh, everyone can see my screen, right? Yep, we can see your screen, bro. And excellent. Thanks very much. So, uh, as I said, uh, this this work that I'm going to be kind of uh, presenting is uh, has been uh, work that I've been doing for many many years. In fact, uh, the work actually started just after uh, May 2002, uh, after, just after 9/11. There's been quite a lot of funding available around the world for biometric activities, as you would know, um, if you can cast your mind back then. Uh, there was a demand for quite a lot of biometric uh, um, signatures, biometric identities, and, and including face recognition, gait recognition, fingerprint, DNA, and so, so uh, many other, uh, other biometric entities. 
So one of the things that I was interested in is actually looking at face recognition, and that's how it started. In fact, the first PhD student who worked under me in face recognition is now a professor uh, in a UK university. So that's how long it's kind of gone in terms of kind of the work that I'm doing uh, in this area. And so why faces? Obviously, faces are very, very interesting because one of the reasons why faces, I find human faces uh, interesting is because it's the most common visual entity that you will see in your entire life. If you think about it, we, we uh, relate to faces. We, it's in, important for us, to, for us humans to be able to recognize faces and read faces. Uh, and it's, it's, it's part of what, what we are. So it's very common. I mean, in fact, it's one of the most common entities that you will see in your entire life. So there's no there's there's a special uh, parts in our brain to actually process faces as well as distinguish faces, uh, and there are many traits uh, that we can actually learn from uh, from faces itself. For example, biometrics is one of the things. Uh, face recognition: every face is identical as um, identically unique, um, and uh, things like uh, smile uh, has uh, sort of you know associated with longevity, for example, again, knowing the smile, the smile itself is a uh, biometric identity. Think, uh, things like uh, disease and disorder prediction from the face, these are common things that, uh, that are kind of being studied uh, as part of the face, the general kind of face research, which we are doing at our Center for Visual Computing as well. Quite a number of these, these topics are being kind of uh, um, under, under study in our, in, in, um, our lab, um, lab as well. Um, so here, here is an example, here, uh, just a very, very simple example in kind of face analysis. This is actually my face. I'm actually reading my, uh, essentially my blood pressure from just a small window on, the, on, 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 on there. You can see that in this video, uh, essentially just looking at that, this video and, and try ch looking at how the changes in, in kind of frame, uh, the, the change happens, it actually looks at the bl blood flow and try and identify the uh, the kind of blood pressure just look just from a video um, here so this is just a, an example of how powerful this kind of face analysis and face recognition systems can be um giving you but i don't want to talk about too much about kind of the face analysis stuff but i'm more, more interested in talking about the the face recognition some of the recent developments in face recognition uh, uh by ourselves and also by other people around the world in in this area uh, which is what kind of I'm, I'm, I'm more interested in, in, in talking about uh, today. So let me just start with uh, an interesting experiment that this is a physical experiment that uh, people carry out and this has been uh, done quite a number of times. So they basically um, what they do is uh, uh, in uh, newborn babies, uh, they do this experiment. So these babies are just newborn in the hospital or wherever they are. They haven't seen anything in the world uh, so what they do is they put this kind of smiley face on the on a placard and they start kind of showing this to the to the baby okay and interestingly what happens is the baby starts tracking this face like object you know on the placard so it's basically just two eyes and a mouth as you can see like this and um, when you start actually showing this the baby starts actually looking at this and then starts tracking it so obviously the baby is interested in this object which looks like a face now that's quite interesting uh, in the sense because the baby hasn't actually seen anything in the world before. It's just, it's, you know, this is the first, probably the first object this baby has seen. So just to make sure that the baby is uh, seeing faces or face-like objects, what they do is they repeat the experiment uh, sometimes on different newborn babies. But this time what they do is they actually put the face upside down. So the eyes are at the bottom and the mouth is at the top so you can see here and then you put this in the placard and then try to wave across to the baby's face and it's just interestingly this baby these babies are not interested in actually um these faces so it's quite interesting in that sense that that uh that what it shows is uh and in fact in experiments that they've proved it in physical experiments in primates they proved it that uh, there are special parts in our brain to actually look face, like, look for face-like objects and process faces. So that's quite interesting from that point of view. And that tells us quite a lot about, uh, uh, at the beginning, as I said, 
the, the, the entities and the, the, the capacity for humans to actually process faces. And that's that's important. And, and the idea for us is to actually kind of utilize this uh, to try and uh, train machines to do this. And that's kind of my work. My, I mean, I'm not interested in kind of looking at the, the physical um, human uh, uh, based face recognition, which is not kind of our area. What we are interested in is actually uh, learning from these human-based face recognition examples and um, and experiments and try and see whether we can replicate this in machines, in machine algorithms. And that's kind of the the, the, the important thing that we want to do. Now, again, here is an, here's a very interesting example. Now, if you, if you saw this face or this part of the face, just the eyes, you already probably know who this person is. And this is how powerful our human face recognition capacity is, I'm sure, most of you who are watching this will know who this person is. And probably, uh, I would say 99% of you probably will not have met this person before, but you probably have seen this person on TV many times uh, or on pictures, and you can recognize with it. So uh, clearly it's uh, Barack Obama, as you can see um, from the pictures. So again, that just kind of highlights how powerful it, our face recognition systems. And, and we have a challenge in machine-based face recognition algorithms to actually replicate this and probably to go beyond this. So face recognition is a very good example of testing uh, computer-based algorithms as well. So that's another thing. Now, there is also a flip side to this. Now, if I show you these examples or these faces and ask you the question, are these the same people? Are they identical twins or are they twins? It's very, very likely that when you look closely you will you will say yes they are twins or they uh, if not identical twins they look alike uh, we will come back to this question so so there is a limit in the sense there is a limit on human face recognition as well to actually uh, go um, to that point where we can do some very distinguished face recognition and 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 that's a point that kind of I want to highlight later on uh, as well where we can try and beat kind of even almost to the point where we can beat human face recognition uh, using machine learning algorithms once you train a machine learning algorithm properly. So that's kind of a, a, a point that I would want to make. So just to, just to kind of put this in the, in the sort of right context, um, the face recognition stuff that we're talking about here is, there are two types of face recognition, by the way. One is what we call the verification. So um, uh, in most of the kind of uh, in developed countries in uh, border control points, for example, you have a one-to-one -one face matching, which is like you go through the passport control, you put your passport through, you look at the camera and the passport actually, uh, the picture on the passport and the camera, the, the picture you, you show on the camera, it tries to match. So this is a one-to-one -one matching. So essentially you are matching if the person you are seeing on the camera is the same person on the passport. Well, that's a kind of a very straightforward thing these days. And, and it's a sole problem. One-to-one -one face recognition problem is a sole problem. There's nothing to solve because given those conditions, you can see that it's, there's an almost kind of 100% match between the passport picture and the picture that you see on the camera. But the, the, the problem comes when you have a million or maybe 80 million or 100 million faces in a database and you have maybe just a small part of the face, maybe the eye or the nose, or or even a very small proportion of the face uh, as a cue. And then what you want to do is you want to see whether that person is actually inside that database, say 80 million or 100 million faces. Now that's a very huge challenge. Now, if you throw this challenge to a human, let's just say, let's say you give a million faces in a database and you say, okay, here's a part of the face. Can you try and go and find the the person which matches in that, assuming that this person exists in that data set. Now, that's a very, very hard problem even for humans to do. So what we want to do is we want to take that challenge and then we want to try and see if the computer can do this for us. And this is exactly what we're doing at this point in time. We're trying to do this and we are succeeding in this and we have very, very good results to show you. So I'll show you some of the results that, that we're showing. So just to put that in context, this is called one-to-many matching. So you have a large database of faces, millions and millions, and you have a very small part of the face that you want to try and see whether you can match. And that's not a very easy task to do. So um, just to tell you that uh, 
generally in the past before kind of the the, the machine learning or deep learning came uh, uh, about um, there are ways to actually do face recognition so what you do is you actually identify the face uh, from uh, a picture or from a scene uh, through landmarks and then you identify the region of the face and then you go and look at for certain regions of the face so you can look at the eye the cheek and the mouth and so on and so forth so pre uh, deep learning or pre machine learning uh, models kind of standard uh, face processing models actually are very very ad hoc in the sense that they they start looking at part of the face and then they opt optimize that for that part of the face and then what happens is the rest of the face doesn't get recognized. So it's a very, very ad hoc, very cumbersome way of recognizing faces. And this is probably, I would say, pre-2012. Just before 2012, people were looking at face recognition through this sort of traditional um, sort of uh, image processing type things, uh, type uh, mechanisms. And that's very cumbersome, very inefficient compared to what we have today. So uh, 2012 kind of was a, a turning point for uh, for us quite a lot of researchers in face recognition. And we, we actually kind of leapfrogged um, uh, with the advent of, of, of obviously kind of deep learning, which I'll, I'll talk in a minute. Uh, so it is mostly kind of, you know, those ad hoc um, techniques are not being used now. So what I want to do is I want to explain kind of the, the kind of theory or, or the understanding behind how we got about doing face recognition. But, but for that, I, um, ex to explain that, I need to actually explain to you what deep learning is. So remember, the traditional machine, uh, traditional kind of machine learning or traditional image processing is you go and look at very specific parts of the face or the object, and then you try and do it. So it could, it could be you're looking at maybe the color of the face and, and the texture, and then you're looking at the, the dimensions of the face and things like that using very traditional kind of image processing techniques. And that's very inefficient. But deep learning is slightly different in the sense that what you do is you have a you you throw in kind of lots of data into into uh, some sort of a framework, and then you learn by example. So just imagine this: you have a say four year old or a three year old, and you want to teach this three year old what an apple looks like. So what what do you do? You basically show an apple, and the interesting thing is once you show like a few apples. Or, or even images of apples that the four-year-old actually understands what an apple is and you don't have to show quite a lot of apples you, you can show just a few apples and the the, the four-year-old or three-year-old actually understands and this uh, child can distinguish between an apple and a pear very easily so what happens in the brain is actually uh, this kind of deep learning um, in, in a sense it happens so we're trying to mimic this in the computer so what we do is in the computer we actually show if you want to uh, create um, a machine learning algorithm for recognizing apples. What we do is we show lots of apples to this computer algorithm. So lots, when I say lots, we show thousands, probably millions of apples of, of different colors, different uh, orientation and so on and so forth. But once you show enough apples, the algorithm actually understands uh, what an apple is in a holistic way. So it is it, not a kind of image image recognition, but in a holistic way, it actually understands what an apple is. So that's kind of deep learning. And, and, and that's kind of what we use uh, these days for kind of most of the kind of image recognition, including face recognition techniques. So that's basically what deep learning is, it's essentially learning by example. So you show lots of examples of a given thing um, and it doesn't really matter what what orientation how you want to show these examples you can throw lots and lots of this data into the algorithm and the algorithm actually figures out uh what this uh apple or whatever shape is uh, and similarly we can do for faces as well so this idea of deep learning is actually not new it's, the the idea is about 50 at least 50 years old so is is these people is is uh uh, Warren McClough and uh, Rosenwald in 1958, they, they came up with this idea of kind of, you know, uh, they, they were inspired by the um, neural system of the brain, uh, brain, and they say we could actually utilize this idea uh, in, a, in a computational algorithmic way. So essentially kind of using that kind of firing of the neural and a connection between the neurons in the brain. So essentially, if you have uh, imagine that you have an input, uh, of a certain set of uh, input, which are can be apples and, and, and pairs, let's say. In mathematical terms, you can say x1, x2, x3. So these are kind of different inputs. And then 
you have a certain set of weights that you associate. So these weights are associated. So, so some weights will be associated with uh, the apple and some weights will be associated with the pears, for example. And then you can actually pass it through and then you can do recognition. So this is, this is essentially in very brief terms how deep learning works. And we're using this. So the, the idea here is that you can throw kind of lots of data of a, a certain type into this kind of um, a network or, or, or the structure, and then you can do uh, recognition and you can, you can do the classification based on that. So that's uh, the kind of idea behind the deep learning. And it's, it's very different from traditional kind of uh, image processing techniques. It's also very, very powerful. Although, uh, although, uh, people say deep learning and intelligence. I don't. I don't really believe deep learning has actually intelligence, but it has got very powerful capacity to do classification, and and that's the kind of thing that we're using for kind of uh, our work. So as I said before, 2012 was a very good year for deep learning because um, uh, uh, there was a, a big experiment in which they showed the ImageNet. ImageNet has got 15 million labeled data data sets and of 22,000 categories. And they showed that uh, using this kind of deep learning techniques, you can actually uh, uh, get almost an 85% recognition rate, which was very, very powerful. So that means 85% of the time you can get these objects, you know, pulled out from this data set of 15 million uh, objects, uh, image objects in that data set. So that's a very, very good point for machine learning and deep learning. And since 2012, people have started a kind of using this uh, deep learning framework for many things, including kind of face recognition, which we are doing at the moment. So how do we use deep learning face recognition? Well, as I said before, you start with faces and then you show faces into this kind of black box type deep learning environment. So you show lots of faces, you keep showing these faces and the algorithm keeps learning about the faces as, as you go along, uh, different faces at different orientation and different types and, and maybe in different environments. And, and the machine actually learns. So it goes through different kind of layers and actually filters out maybe the color, the texture, the shape and the orientation and so many other things. And it looks at this and then it uses that. So for example, here is, so here is it. In, in, in our case, for example, we, we utilize this and we boil this face recognition into essentially 128 floating point numbers. So what that means is any face we can encode using just 128 floating point numbers. Okay, uh, so the, the the process by which it actually does this is kind of almost kind of irrelevant in 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 a kind of block box type thing. But ultimately, you can encode any human face using these 128 floating point numbers. Your face, my face, anyone else in the entire planet, you can just look at their face. You can identify 128 floating point numbers, which uniquely represents that face. So it's a very, very powerful way of actually representing human faces. Uh, and the heart of it is actually deep learning, the machine learning um, algorithm. So that's basically what we use. So once we have a technique like this, it becomes very powerful to try and utilize it. So you can imagine you, if, if you have 20 million or 100 million people in a, in a database, you just have to have 100 million times 128 numbers saved in a data set and that's everyone's uh, face is saved you don't have to actually save the physical face you can save those numbers and utilize those so just show you an example of how powerful our face recognition system is you have here um uh in the middle you have obviously uh image of, of the queen and then also outside we have images of the queen now if i showed you some of these images outside uh around um, it would be very hard for you to say, yes, this is queen, if I just showed you that example just as, as, a, as a single example. So, for example, if I showed you that example, I don't think you would actually um, recognize that as, as the queen, just, just from that picture. But in our case, in our algorithm, it does. It says 77.2% uh, similarity between this image and that image. Uh, by the way, if you have 70% and above similarity, that means it's identical, um, it's, it's an identity match. So this means any, uh, you can see here in these numbers, everything is about 70%. That means all of these images are um, ident um, an identity match to the image in the middle, which is obviously we're saying that all these images are of the queen. 
And then similarly, if you look at this image, again, it's very, very hard for humans to, to say, yeah, this is the queen, just, just looking at the image itself. But in our case, in our algorithm, it, we can easily distinguish uh, this as the queen uh, using our algorithm. So that's kind of very powerful and, and, and very powerful way of actually using it. So coming back to the image that I showed you on those um, uh, um, images where I showed and asked the question, are they, are they the same people or are they kind of, you know, um, uh, identical twins or are they related? In fact, they're not related. They, they're not in, in any case, any way related, actually. They, um, they're called twin strangers. So basically people go around and find people who look alike around the world and then they're trying to match. This is what could be, they call twin strangers. And these people are kind of not really related uh, by blood in any form or shape at, at all. Surely their DNAs will be different and so on and so forth. But interestingly, uh, sometimes for our, from our visual perspective, they might look the same person. But from our algorithm uh, perspective, they are different people as, as you can see from here um, that uh, in this case, this is 66.5%. That means it's not 70% or 70% uh, below 70%. So that means they are not the same person. And again, here in this case, 65.4%, they're not the same person. Same, same goes here. So none of these two images that are side by side, they're the, of the same people. They're different identities as we can confirm from our, our experiments and, um, and using our algorithm. So the point that, to make, um, that I like to make here is that this algorithm is actually very, very powerful and we can utilize this to do uh, very powerful um, essential face recognition um, um, as well. One of the things that um, we have been kind of trying to actually, uh, as part of face recognition, is trying to incorporate aging into face recognition. Again, this is very important uh, in many ways. First of all, um, especially in the UK, for example, you are given a passport for 10 years. And by the ninth year, you probably don't look like anything like in your passport, especially for young kids, the, 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 their faces change quite rapidly over, over that very short period of time. So what we were interested in is how can we train an algorithm to actually uh, um, recognize uh, kind of age faces. So here's an example, uh, an input face, and then you try and recognize this um, through kind of, you know, face uh, age, the face, and then trying to identify what the face looks like. So how do we do this? Okay. The way we do it is again we use machine learning. So we take a, a, a big database of um, uh, different ethnicities, different ages, and throw this into the machine learning deep learning algorithm and says figure out what, how humans age. And the machine learning actually goes and uh, figures out how humans age. And we don't really do a lot, so the so the, the machine learning actually does quite the work for us. And 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 we get an algorithm out and then we can use it. So for, for example, here's an example where the input image is zero, and then these are our predicted images. Uh, so this is actually Princess Charlotte of, of, uh, of the UK. So this is the input image, and these are our predictions, age two, seven, and 20. Now, you might be asking the question, how do we know that this is accurate? Surely it's a fair question to ask, yes. So the way we do is we can actually take an image and de-age using our algorithm. So we can, we can work backwards. So for example, we can take Angelina Jolie's uh, uh, face at 40 years, and then we can actually uh, de-age her to uh, six, for example, and then we can take an exact image of her at age six and then compare between the two. So that if the face recognition then passes through, then we know that it's the same person. So or at least we know that our face aging algorithm is, is fairly accurate. And you can do this. So say here's, here's a, an example from my, my picture um, when I was 46. And then this is me de-aged uh, to 10, just uh, so that the one on the right here is, is a computer generated algorithm, uh, sorry, computer generated face, not, not actually a real face. So then you can take that image and then you can compare with the real face if, if you want it. So we have used this kind of face aging uh, to actually um, uh, try and identify lost children, what, what they would look like. Um, we, have, we have done quite a lot of high profile cases. So we, here's an example of Madeline McCain. Uh, so this is our generated image, what she would look like now. And this was uh, an image that uh, we got what she would, uh, she was um, like when she, um, when she was lost. So again, uh, a very useful tool for identifying uh, what people look, may look like in years uh, apart, especially for missing children. This is a, 
this is a very important uh, piece of work that we're doing and we be helping the community and and the law enforcement is actually trying to do it to, trying to kind of um, create these images which is kind of very helpful for for people for finding missing people um uh, again uh one of the other things that we do is we, we as i said we, we use partial faces so uh looking at partial faces we, we we run quite a lot of experiments where we try and find which part of the face is the best recognition cue so you can see like from the top half uh, right half, three quarter, full faces. Uh, you can see there's almost kind of hundred percent recognition. So in our algorithm, all we need is just probably the eye, or just, even just one eye is enough to recognize that person from the kind of deep learning algorithms that we have developed so far. So it's a very very powerful algorithm, um, and 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 it's very powerful in the sense of recognizing faces, as you can see from him uh, here in this example. Uh, so it's a very uh, a good example to show if I showed you these two uh, um, eyes uh, and ask you the question, is this the same person? Um, I'm pretty sure you will struggle if you don't know this person, if you haven't met this person. In fact, uh, our algorithm says it's the same person and it is in fact the same person. It's, uh, we are matching just from the eyes, uh, these two photos by 80.58%. So that means the algorithm is very powerful as you can see from, from here. Uh, uh, again, for uh, recognizing faces with masks, uh, we're running uh, at the moment, we, we're running these experiments and we've got algorithms actually to deploy. Uh, again, very relevant uh, to these days uh, that recognizing faces, uh, by the way, your iPhone, you won't be able to unlock your iPhone with your mask uh, because the iPhone wants to see whether you have a face or part of the nose and the mouth is essential for you to kind of um, unlock your iPhone. Uh, but we're trying to actually work out uh, algorithms to actually utilize it. So just you can you can recognize faces just from the eyes or, or part of the top half of the face. So how does um, how does this how how can we use this for uh, for identifying sp spies, which is kind of uh, you know uh, the title of the talk. So this is uh, we we do quite a lot of high profile work on on identifying these sort of criminal cases and faces. So this was kind of a, a, a Russian um, case, a spy case where we had we, we, we were given two faces by the Bellingcat and we were asked to see whether these are the same people. So the, the way we do is we actually take the face, we age them to the common face, uh, common age, and then we use our deep learning algorithms to do the recognition. So these are, if you look at it, these two people are very different, they look very different, uh, but they're the same people. In fact, they have these two faces come from uh, supposedly two different identities. Uh, they they have different names, they have different passports and so on, but actually they are the same person. Um, um, so um, so what, what we were given was these two images and we were asked to see whether this is the same person. In fact, uh, our algorithm, we were, we were quite sure it's the same person. And uh, this was kind of you know, reported in Bellingcat and, and, and the investigation uh, went on. Similarly, uh, again, another kind of Salisbury poisoning case, uh, another suspect, um, um, Alexander Mishkin, again, two identities, um, uh, supposedly two identities, uh, one per uh, 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 a different name, um, another different name, um, they have like two passports and um, they have they assume two identities, but it's the same person again. So we were able to kind of identify and recognize that um, these two uh, images as the same identity. And again, we gave quite a lot of lead to Bellinka to do further investigation in, 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 this, in, in this example. There was a third suspect again in the Salisbury case. Uh, again, we were asked to actually do the matching between this. Um, in this particular picture, the, the quality is not as good, but again, we were able to kind of uh, do the matching. And here you can see 78.2% similarity, which means um, they are the same people. Again, we, we gave a, a, quite a good lead um, for Bellinka to do the investigation in this area. We do quite a lot of high profile work in this area, uh, some of which obviously I can't uh, disclose, uh, but uh, very, very interesting kind of, you know, very helpful um, work that we do uh, to help the community in, in this area. And here's a, here's a final case where we uh, helped uh, the New York Times uh, with the Khashoggi, uh, uh, mur murder case uh, where there were some potential suspects and they wanted to kind of do an identity on these persons. So the middle is uh, is the image uh, uh, from um, 
the from one of the Apple cameras. And these are the kind of images from social media trolls and viewers to see whether this is a match. Again, we could we could identify for New York Times at, that it is a match. Um, so I think the, the point uh, that I kind of wanted to make here is that um, uh, the work that we've been doing, uh, we've been uh, rapidly progressing in terms of kind of face recognition and face identification. And uh, we have uh, kind of gone, uh, we have done a massive leapfrog, especially in the last, I would say, last uh, five to 10 years, we have done quite a lot of work in this area. And, and the algorithms are becoming more powerful and powerful every day. And the deep learning algorithms are kind of helping us, the deep learning network and the framework are helping us actually to do this. Uh, obviously, there are quite a lot of work to do in this area. For example, identical twins is, a, is an interesting question, which we haven't uh, solved, and we, we are currently working on those. Uh, with that, I probably will stop. I think um, people might have questions for me, or, or I don't know. Uh, thanks very much. Um, and thanks very much for listening, and thanks very much uh, for giving the opportunity. Uh, Prof. Norasman, you need to unmute. We cannot hear you. Right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Hassan, for the wonderful presentation and sharing session to us. Uh, maybe I welcome everyone to share their question, if any. Uh, is there any question that uh, we can discuss? Or okay, if no question, maybe I try to start the question, okay? So we know that face, face recognition is very important for our society. And of course, uh, it has a lot of advantages. And, and this technology is getting better and uh, with a better accuracy, okay, in the future and so on. However, maybe you can share, uh, Prof, uh, from your point of view, uh, on the disadvantages of face recognition on our society, because we, we, we are in different culture, we are different ethnic, and of course we are in different religious. So maybe you can have some idea. Yes, we, we agree that face recognition technology is very important and it changed our life somehow, but maybe there are some disadvantages of, speech, yeah. of uh, facial recognition. Yeah, thanks, th thanks for the, uh, that question. Um, I usually don't go into kind of philosophy of you know advantages and disadvantages, but I, I'll I'll share I'll share kind of my thoughts on it. Uh, so as a scientist, some sometimes as as scientists, what we want to do is we want to a, um, address a challenge. Uh, but sometimes you're right, and and these challenges have to be addressed quite carefully. And also, we need to make sure the technology that we develop is actually utilized sensibly, uh, and res responsibly, and and that's very very important. So one of the disadvantages of face recognition, as you would say, is, is actually very cheap. Anybody can deploy it. Um, that's a disadvantage because um, in that sense that anybody can get their hands on this technology because the deep learning framework that I talked about, some of this is available for free. You know, you can you can put together a deep learning face recognition algorithm if you know if you know a bit about deep learning and machine learning. You can you can do it in in a week's time. You can put together a very powerful face recognition time, face recognition algorithm, in a week's time, and then you can start using this, probably on the streets, collecting people's faces and data. Now that's where the danger happens when you start kind of taking people's faces, the the, the the data, and utilizing it unnecessarily. So the question then here is that. Um, how do we actually, for example, how do we save this data? Do we keep the face data? Is it important for us to keep that data? So, uh, so I think one of the fundamental disadvantages is actually the, the data sharing and where uh, kind of people's privacy is and, 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 and uh, are you going to be just uh, keeping that data in your database uh, for other purposes and things like that. So that's kind of one of the things uh, in terms of the disadvantages. There's also another thing that I like to highlight. Um, because of the accuracy that we are getting on face recognition, people assume this is going to be 100% accurate all the time. And it's not, I must say it's not. And you can falsely, you know, identify people easily using these systems, you know, because we are using deep learning. We don't really know too much about deep learning. In my mind, we don't because we treat them as a black box. So there are, there are, there is potential that people can be 
uh, recognized wrongly as well using this. It, there are rare cases, but it can happen. Uh, so that's, again, that's a disadvantage. Um, I think when we weigh, weigh the advantage, you see, every technology, every technology you think of, there is some, there is a degree of disadvantage. So, so does face recognition. And face recognition has been highlighted as kind of a, a big thing. There, there are groups talking about banning face recognition throughout, you know, um, the entire humanity. Uh, I wouldn't want to go to that far, I guess, because uh, I think there are advantages in face recognition. But at the same time, I think the important point here is that deploying face recognition, we have to do it uh, responsibly and sensibly, I think. Okay, thank you, Professor Hassan. Uh, let's go for another question, because on the Facebook, we have one question from uh, Professor Said Alatas. Okay. Uh, yeah, sure. so, uh, yeah, I, I can see the question. Yes, yeah, so it says, uh, yeah. I'm working. Uh, I'm working with detecting uh, deep fake faces. How good are you all, is your algorithm detecting these deep fake faces? Uh, we, uh, I don't know the answer to that question because we we, we don't work with uh, deep fakes. I mean, we we have algorithms where we actually create fake faces as part of our um, um, data sets to actually um, for face recognition. But uh, uh, so so again, deep fakes is. Um, we haven't specifically done these uh, these um, tests, so I can't really tell you the results. But my my feeling is, uh, I showed you the kind of um, those um, identical twin-like faces, and they look very real. They look they look very similar, as you can see. Although they are twin strangers, they they look very similar. So our algorithm was successfully able to kind of detect uh, the difference between those faces. So if if that is the case, my feeling is we should be able to kind of identify deep fakes using our face recognition algorithms, although I haven't really tried this, so I couldn't really tell you the answer, to exact exact answer to that question. Hmm. Right, I think that's a great explanation as well. And uh, the response from our Facebook viewer is fantastic. So we have more than 150 uh, join our conversation, and maybe the sharing will be expanded uh, through different channel anyway. Mm -hmm. Uh, is there any other question that we can uh, discuss? Because I, 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 yeah, I think there's, there's an interesting question here. A deep a deep learning can generate excellent results, but it's uh, inevitably a black box. Very true, yes. The deep uh, middle layers for facial recognition, for example, are unknown. This poses a, a, a dilemma for researchers aiming to create novelty and original contribution explaining. Um, yes, exactly. I, I, I do agree. I mean, um, I do agree, but deep learning is the only uh, kind of... Um, the, the the best we have and and it's not ideal uh, i agree and one of the things that we are currently studying is this we we, we want to find out what is happening with all these uh, kind of layers so for example layer one one of the layers has got um the the ethnicity in it uh the uh, one one layer has got age in it so there are many layers of uh, which actually tells quite a lot about that particular face so the the I think one of the things that people are going to be starting to look at is this explainable AI, and that that uh, term has started um, in, in kind of in research. A lot of people are talking about it. So one of the things that we really want to find out is when we train a, a deep learning based uh, algorithm for face recognition, uh, how does it fare? Uh, I mean, even we, we've seen examples where, for example, it actually identifies. Uh, black faces as gorillas and and, and 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 we have seen those and that's because probably that particular algorithm was trained on predominantly white faces and when it, when it sees a black face it doesn't see it, it just doesn't think it's a, a, a you know it's a face and um, it just thinks it's a monkey or a gorilla and now there's actually to be to be fair there's nothing wrong with the actual algorithm itself because the algorithm only understands what we teach to it so it's it's the way we actually give the data to it um, and there's an important point here that to actually understand how um, how deep learning works and, and opening that black box, trying to identify which each layer is. And, and I think there's a huge uh, piece of work to be done there for us to get that trust in, in, in deep learning. And this is, this is not just for face recognition. This is for everything. We've got even a bigger problem here in the sense of medical imaging. You know, we're trying to use these deep learning systems to do medical diagnosis. And we don't really know exactly what is actually happening. All we know is for a given data set, if we train it well, it does well, it gives you 99% accuracy. 
but that that one percent what happens to it we don't really know so it's a very difficult thing um very very difficult thing to to say at least uh, in the case of a human we can give some sort of an explanation saying oh i don't know uh, if you if you if, if i if 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 you gave a human two images and say can you say the difference between these and the similarities a human can actually explain and say something and so we can almost kind of empathize even if even if a human says it wrongly uh, kind of classifies wrongly but when a machine does it wrongly oh, you know because the machine we kind of switch off the machine and says this thing doesn't work uh, the problem is the machine doesn't have the capacity to explain its own mistakes so this is where a new thread of research must come in and say all this explainable ai everything to do with deep learning needs to be explained and i i personally don't think deep learning is the solution for ultimate um, um artificial intelligence it is not because it, it deep learning is not intelligent it is just a classification mechanism there's no intelligence to it well there's some sort of intelligence but it's not really how i would define an intelligence so there's a very huge limit to deep learning i agree and something new has to come out but also in the meantime if we're if we're going further afield with deep learning i think we need to explain we need to find how we can explain um the deep learning uh, network architecture the black boxes and things like that i hope that it kind of explains that okay so um right so maybe i try to give uh, some uh maybe the last question okay uh in university we we are aiming to to produce or generate a talent okay we can see that uh, recent proposal phd thesis masters uh, try to embed deep learning into their title of the thesis yes so basically from uh, uk also may have the similar patterns okay yes. so uh, on academic point of view maybe i would like uh, would like to ask you about your opinion uh, what are the basic requirements uh, for a researcher who's interested in doing research in deep learning? Because we can see deep learning in every faculty, not just in faculty of yes. engineering, yes. but also yes. in different faculty, yes. computer, electrical engineering, and so on. So maybe you can say something about basic uh, knowledge. Uh, actually, we, we, we also try to create a new Professor Hassan in future, maybe. Okay, yes. <laughs> okay, so yeah, yeah, that, 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 that's very, yeah. The, the requirement of the knowledge. Yeah, that's a very good question and a very good comment. Um, yeah, you're right, actually. Uh, uh, machine learning, especially kind of new uh, convolutional neural networks, deep learning is, is everywhere. And you're right, it's not just PhD thesis, it's not just master's thesis. Uh, it's every, literally everywhere. You open a journal paper these days, it's it's got convolutional neural networks on it, or it's got some sort of deep learning or machine learning on it. I I, I honestly don't know why everyone is going on this bandwagon of deep learning. I, I use deep learning, but it's not the solution for everything. To start with, I'll tell you, you know, it's not the solution for everything, every problem. People are just going on this bandwagon of deep learning and saying, oh, I just want to do something on it. That's fine. That's okay. But we need to understand that. So to answer your question, I think you need to you need to have the basic background knowledge. So first of all, you need to know your your your, your mathematics, your your algebra, your linear algebra. Uh, you know those are kind of essential for for you to kind of understand um, deep learning. Um, you also need to know a bit of statistics, uh, and then you then you need to go and uh, obviously. Kind of read basic um, machine learning books. So uh, also remember, machine learning is a very very old topic. It's at least, as I said, even deep learning itself is at least fifty years old. The uh, the original idea of the Rosenbelt uh, neural network is is fifty years old. So you can you can there's lots of textbooks, traditional textbooks to do it. But but I would suggest um, first of all just read the basics of deep learning without going into the theory too much understand the basic architecture and how these uh, architectures are created very similar to what i just described in my in my talk so go and go and read that first and understand from uh, almost kind of a, a um uh i would say 
uh, a, a, an ordinary kind of background from, from that point of view, read it, and then go and start understanding it in deep. Uh, but also, also make sure that um, just don't go on the bandwagon of what other people are doing and, and then try and repeat that. Try and see whether you can just try and add something new to it in the sense, you know, there's, there's various kinds of deep learning that come across. So for example, GANs, generative adversarial networks are a very cool thing to, to have, you know, these days. A, a lot of people are working on it. We are also working on it, but we don't specifically work on things just because it's a cool thing. We just try and identify a problem and see whether we can use that deep learning or whatever to solve that problem. So when we looked at the face recognition, we realized actually deep learning is very good for face recognition. This is why we're using it. We still use very traditional algorithms uh, for image processing and things like that for many applications. We just don't use deep learning just because it is it is a hot topic. Yeah. Okay. So I hope that explains it. And yeah. All right. Uh, thank you so much for wonderful presentation again. And uh, the way that you're answering the question is really fantastic. So I think that's all for our distin distinguished uh, lecture series. Uh, oh, in a minute, we have another question. Are you okay, Prof. Hassan? To... Yeah, 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 no problem, yeah. Okay. So uh, can, we have, can we use face regression to identify, I guess it may miss recognition, to identify if persons suffer from some disease or not and how to develop the algorithms to increase. Okay. Uh, it's not really face recognition, it's called face analysis. So you can use face analysis to identify um, uh, um, uh, different types of um, ailments and so, so things like depression, for example, you can start looking at people's facial expressions. And this is something that we do quite a lot in, in, in our lab. So we, we identify, for example, people's um, facial expressions, their smile pattern, how often they smile. And, and you know, so you, you can start kind of almost categorizing um, the basic emotions, happy, sad, and things like that. And then you can, if you start categorizing it, this is this you know, on a, in a very basic way. If you start doing that, you can you can almost kind of start profiling that. That's one way to do it. And again, uh, once you have enough um, enough of that, you you need uh, uh, if you want to use the, uh, deep learning in this area, or if you you want to use machine learning in this area you need uh, good data sets. So that's one of the key things in, in, in machine learning, in, in deep learning, is you need to have a good data set. If you don't have data sets, uh, deep learning is not good for you or, or machine learning is not good for you. Remember, deep learning learns by example. So you need to provide good examples first. Uh, um, so so in, in the case of trying to actually identify um, um, people's conditions, say depression or other conditions, you will need to have a, you will need to have data sets of people who are depressed to start with you know so for example faces and fa uh, emotional and so on and so forth so once you have that you can then use deep learning to try and and do uh, the training and, and the matching that's possible but although I, I I wouldn't want to go too far and and utilize these systems for kind of diagnosis because it's, it's, it's still as, as I said as I pointed out, it's still very much infancy. So if you had, let's say, 10 people, 10 depressed people, you had the data set and then you trained on, on five people and you tested on five people, you will probably get 99% accuracy, yeah? But you can't scale that. You only did it on 10 people, yeah? You probably will have to do probably thousands and thousands of people before you can say, hey, I've got an algorithm which can diagnose depression by just looking at your face. You can probably do that. The main important thing is the data. So where do you get the data set? You know, so that's the hard bit about kind of deep learning. And this is why I, I always. Um, so this is a, again a, a slightly side thing. Um, this is why I don't think there will be, um, for example, self-driving cars on our roads for a long, long time. People think self-driving cars are going to be there next year. No, they won't be. Um, trust me, I don't think they will be, because self-driving cars rely on deep learning for recognition and deep learning is not that good. You know, you can't rely, you can't rely to drive an autonomous car on just deep learning because just, just imagine just for, you need a, enough cases, you need enough cases to actually teach the algorithm for it to recognize. So you need to teach every, every symbol, everything, uh, every part of the road to the algorithm very efficiently for it to actually 
understand and recognize and make some sense of it. That's not how humans drive, by the way. Humans don't need to learn. Once you know the basic uh, roadway and the signage, you don't need to say, oh, there's, there's going to be a sign here. So make sure you remember that you don't do that. That's not how humans drive. So the way a self-drive car is being trained to drive is, is completely different from a, a human drives a car. So just imagine you have a self-driving car, uh, you've trained it, and then suddenly uh, you, you're driving it, and then suddenly a plastic bag comes onto the road somewhere. What does this car do? It hasn't seen a plastic bag before of this shape, of this size. What does it do? It probably doesn't know how to do it, so it stops in the middle of the road. So my point is, um, for deep learning, it's, it's a very much example-based training algorithm, and you need lots of examples to do that. So, but that's not it's not how humans actually use and learn uh, things. So it's very different. Uh, so, you know, it, we have to use these algorithms with a pinch of salt. If 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 that's, if if, the, if I want to send a message, I think that's that's what it, it is. Very very good in in classification. It's very good in classification, but that's where it stops. It, it's not intelligent. It's just very good at classification. Okay, thank you, Prof. Hassan. Um, I still remember uh, our discussion about the, one of the research, quite interesting research that you have done about fake smile that involved a lot of algorithm, not just yeah. face, uh, not just eye, nose, lips, and many others. Angle. It also about fake, uh, fake heart, something like that. So. Uh, <laughs> So it's not easy to determine a uh, fake smile, in, in, in other words. Yeah, okay. it's, it's not, it's not. I mean, um, yeah, again, this is actually to do with uh, uh, video-based uh, face analysis. So in video-based face analysis, you are looking at vid uh, a video of a, uh, somebody smiling and you're looking at every frame and you can have, a, you have a lot of data so you can start looking. So so in in in, in, in smile recognition, what we're doing is we're looking at the dynamics of the smile. So every human being has a very unique smile dynamics. So the way you will smile or you smile and the way I smile are different. In the sense, for example, your smile might start from your left corner of the mouth and then there is a certain distinguished way your mouth moves, the dynamics of it. In a similar way, there is a distinct way your eye moves, um, the, 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 the the cross feet around your eye actually moves. So it's, it's very, very distinct. In fact, it's a biometric because looking at just the smile dynamics, you can uniquely identify that person. So mm. that's what we are using. And and for fake and, um, and genuine smiles, obviously a genuine smile is actually in the eye. You know, you yeah. look yeah. at for cross, cross feet you around. Yeah. Some oh. body language anyway. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Okay, uh, Professor, maybe we go for the last, I think, uh, uh, there will be uh, a lot of questions if we, you know, uh, keep uh, go on with the lecture. I think uh, maybe you have to spend more time. Anyway, can we go for the last question that came from Dr. Faiz, University yes. uh, UTHM, University yeah, of Malaysia. Okay, the question is, what is your view on generative adversarial network? gun and its application so yeah yeah i think i think uh yeah uh, um that is uh gans are a new thing it's 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 it's, it's, a, it's a kind of it's a, it's a way one of the ways is to generate lots of data uh for kind of um for machine learning because uh what it does is it, it can create lots of data so that's one way to do so and then gans are good um for for those kind of purposes um but again i think even gains are based on uh on kind of you know the deep learning architecture the framework we 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 are using gains at the moment to try and see whether we can um uh so that the uh, um, remember the the identical twin problem uh if you had two identical twins by the way our algorithm will fail if you had two identical twins and then if you can't send it our algorithm will fail there's no algorithm that i know of if you have 2D images of identical twins uh, and say, can you identify these two people so, you know, accurately? There's no algorithm in the world I know of that can do it in face recognition, by the way. So, it's, that, that, so here's a challenge for you. If you can solve that problem, 
uh, I like to hear from you. You know, it's it's a very very hard problem. And at the moment, we are we are working on it, and we think that GANs might actually be helpful in this because what GANs are doing is it can generate a, a lot of kind of based on one image or one data point, it can generate lots of similar sort of image uh, data points. So one one idea that we have is if if you want to kind of use uh, if, if you want to do um, identical twin recognition, you can probably utilize GANs to generate lots of uh, images, sub images from each of those images. And then you can try and do some sort of recognition between those image pairs. And then there could be a way that deep underneath one of the layers, there might be some changes that can tell us um, the difference between these two images. Possibly, we don't know. And so this is something that we are working on. So GANs are very good in kind of generating that kind of uh, work. And, and and I think it has got a lot of potential, especially for data augmentation, data generation. Remember, one of the things that I said uh, previously was that for deep learning, you need lots of data. So you can use GANs to generate lots of data. So if you want to train a face recognition system, you can generate a billion faces easily using a GANs algorithm. You know, you just give in like, I don't know, 100 images of um, different faces and different ethnicities. It can give you 1 billion faces, different faces. Uh, these faces do not exist, but they are faces that they look like faces. They're, they're, they're good enough to do training. So that I think one of the things that GANs are helping us to do or people to do is, is that kind of work. Okay. Thank you so much, Prof. Hassan. I think that's all. Uh, that's it. I think uh, we have go through... Uh, a lot of information from your presentation and we can we think that uh, deep learning is about something related with artificial intelligence but actually it's, it's about a classification uh, yes. by learning by example it means that if we have a lot of example and mm -hmm. deep learning will the algorithm of deep learning will work well but without uh, good data without uh, a good data set the, the algorithm will not go in well so this is what we understand from our lecture i think that's all for our sharing session thank you so much for uh, your willingness to share your knowledge uh, in our distinguished lecture series and looking forward to meet you again uh, someday maybe uh, we're going to have some collaboration between utm and Bradford university hopefully yes. Yes, and yeah. for that, I pass over to our Dean, Dr. Rafi. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Azman and Nur Azman, for chairing the session. And thank you for introducing Prof. Hassan Ugel to me. And to our distinguished speaker today, Professor Hassan Ugel, thank you so very much for accepting our invitation and for a great sharing session. It is certainly interesting to, uh, to hear you talking about uh, face recognition, you know, and am I giving uh, the right smile, you know, am I giving you the, the honest smile or not? Uh, you know, hopefully I'm giving you the, my honest smile. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know for, uh, from my computer, my computer will find out and then give, let you have the results. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Looking forward to the results. Uh, again, uh, Prof. Hassan, thank you so much for, for the great uh, sharing session and to all our viewers worldwide. Thank you so much for watching UTM Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series. This has been the 101 DLS from University Technology Malaysia Faculty of Engineering. So until next time, bye-bye for now. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.